Again, it's a pleasure to stand before you once again this day. What I'd like to do this afternoon is really to do a, a review or study of 18th and 19th and 20th chapters of Jeremiah. <clears throat> so you may want to just turn over there and we'll bring in other passages as well. And 18th chapter, of course, is dealing with the uh, uh, potter, you know, making pottery. And we're familiar with this passage. Uh, it's presented in Scripture of potters working with clay. Now, the clay itself has no attractiveness. Um, it's just clay. But it does, it does have potential in the hands of the potter. <clears throat> Whenever the hands of the potter touch it and the thought of the potter is brought to, to bear on it and the plan of the potter is worked out in it and through it, then there's a real transformation in the clay. It becomes something appealing and useful. This uh, imagery is critical to the thought expressed in uh, chapter 18 of this uh, book of Jeremiah. The prophet uh, mentioned here, of course, as the book name indicates, was Jeremiah. And we don't know who the potter was, although he certainly played an important part in this drama. The chief governor, or the, as the ASV says, officer, was Pascur. Now, it's, in East Texas, we may say Pasher, but it's pronounced Pascur. That's in Jeremiah, the 20th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Now, he's the priest, apparently, from what we can gather, is in charge of temple uh, security, chief governor. Now, based on his actions against Jeremiah, his job was to keep uh, peace in the temple and punish troublemakers, which to the established authorities, um, Jeremiah certainly was a troublemaker. Since uh, Pascour considered Jeremiah to be a troublemaker, you know, no one else's involvement is mentioned here, he punished him by striking him, or smote as the King James Version and ASV uh, render it, and they, he uh, confined him in the stocks for the night. But Jeremiah really was the uh, uh, chief actor in this three-act drama. In Jeremiah uh, 18, first part, Jeremiah was the threatened prophet. Now, these events probably occurred in the reign of Jehoiakim. That's the king who burned Jeremiah's prophetic scrolls. Remember that? Jeremiah, the 36th chapter. And like his father, King Josiah, King uh, Jehoiakim had no love for either the Lord or his prophet. He was not the least bit interested in what Jeremiah had to say or the, about things political or spiritual. In the first part of uh, the 18th chapter, of course, it, it mentions the sovereignty of God. There's over 30 words in the Hebrew vocabulary out of a total of 63 related directly to pottery because the manufacture of pottery was a major industry in that day. Pottery uses were pervasive in that area and throughout the world, really. Therefore, pottery manufacture was common. The other uses of the word have the idea of forming, framing, or fashioning, which is what a potter does with clay. No doubt Jeremiah had passed a uh, potter's house, and perhaps this potter's house, many times. But this time God had, had a special message for him that, after he preached it, would put him in the stocks. You know, truth has a way of irritating uh, people, particularly when it con uh, contradicts the narrative of those in power. There is a cost to following the Lord. 
any adverse consequences are not to compare, of course, with the glory of its rewards. Jeremiah received words from the Lord while he was watching a potter engaged in his daily work. The potter set before two parallel stone wheels, as it was in that day, that joined, joined by a shaft. And he turned the bottom wheel with his feet and worked the clay on the top wheel as the wheel rotated, turned around. As Jeremiah watched, he saw that the clay vessel being molded by the potter was marred in the potter's hand so that the vessel was unsuitable for its intended use. The potter patiently kneaded the clay again and made another useful vessel. It was in such, pro, such a prosaic setting that the Lord caused Jeremiah to hear the words while at the potter's house. Now the interpretation of the image was national relating to the house of Israel, verses 6 through 10. But the application was individual, verses 11 through 17, calling for the response from the people of Judah and Jerusalem. It also calls for a personal response from us today. Now, their interpretation is provided in this uh, uh, chapter as well. The potter, uh, as the potter has uh, power over the clay, so God has sovereign authority over, na over the nations. Now, although he is free to act as he pleases, he is never irresponsible and arbitrary in what he does. His actions are always consistent with his nature, which is holy, just, wise, and loving. God does not need any advice from us, nor do we have the right to criticize what he does. As is said in Romans 11, chapter verse 34, which is quoted from Isaiah and Jeremiah, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why hath you made me like this? Romans 9, chapter verse 20. The Lord presented two scenarios that illustrated his sovereign power over nations. That's in the 7th through 10th verse of chapter 18. If he threatened to judge a nation, and that nation repented, then he would relent and not impose the threatened judgment. He did this with Nineveh when Jonah's preaching brought the city to repentance, Jonah chapter 3. On the other hand, if he promised to bless a nation, as he did Israel in his covenants, and that nation did evil in his sight, then he would withhold the promised blessing and send judgment instead. God neither changes in character nor needs to repent of his actions, Malachi 3rd chapter verse 6, and Numbers 23 verse 19. But he has the sovereign freedom to condition his actions on the responses of the people to his commands. To be sure how God works in the kingdom of men, men is, is sometimes, uh, at times, inscrutable. Miracles happen almost immediately. Bam, it's done. It's easy to understand. There are no long precedents to its working. Now, not so with providence. It may be generations in the making. The relationship between divine uh, sovereignty and human responsibility, that is how it plays out in history. Uh, we may not be able to perceive when it is actually happening, but we do not have to explain how God works in the affairs of, of men. We just need to obey. Then after that, he can handle the history. We live by divine promises and precepts, not theological explanations. And God is not obligated to explain how all the myriad of events and, uh, accomplishes his ends, or even what the ultimate end is to us. And if he did, we probably uh, wouldn't be able to grasp it. As he said in Deuteronomy the 29th chapter, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. 
Jesus stated that it is the keeping of the words of God that is obedience that leads to knowledge that sanctifies John 7, chapter verse 6 through 19. And what's the application here? Um, nations are made up of individuals, and individuals can receive, receive God's word or reject it. Yes, humans are made from the dust and live in a fragile body. Unlike the clay on the potter's wheel, however, we can resist. We have a mind. God uses many different hands to mold our lives, the gospel, parents, siblings, teachers, ministers, authors, household of faith, and so on and so on. But we can fight against them. Our will can resist those things. But if we do resist them, then we are fighting against God. God announced that he was fashioning a disaster, or as the King James and the ASV say, frame, frame evil. That's a word related to potter in the Hebrew, comes from the same word. And he fashioning disaster and devising a plan against the kingdom of Judah. He appealed to the people to return from their evil ways and do good. If people would repent, he would deliver them. But in a fit of pique, the people said, this is, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, verse 12. Sadly, the people were so chained to their sins that they chose to follow their own evil plans. They would rather worship dead idols and suffer for it than serve the true and living God and enjoy his blessings. Truly, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse 9. In rejecting their God and choosing dumb idols, the people of Judah were acting contrary to everything reasonable. God made them for himself, and they could not succeed apart from him. Just as the clay is pliable in the potter's hand, so are the nations. He said, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, implying that it's done, Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, verse 7 through 8. The consequences implied in this statement are conditional. If they turn from their evil, the intended disaster will not happen. In almost the same words, he repeats the uh, uh, consequential but conditional statement. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which, with which I said I would benefit it. That's in the ninth and 10th verses of chapter 18. Even the heathen nations did not abandon their gods, false as these gods were. Yet God's people, however, were totally inconsistent, willing to enjoy God's blessings, but not willing to obey his laws from which those blessings were derived. Instead of walking on God's clear and safe highway of holiness, the people were on a dangerous and painful detour because they abandoned the ancient path, path of God's holy law. <clears throat> because they would not repent, God had to chasten them. This meant run for the land and exile for the people. Instead of his face shining upon them in blessing, Numbers 6, chapter, verse 24 through 26, God would turn his back on them and leave them to their own devices. Like the patient potter, God is willing to mold us again when we resist him and damage our own lives. No failure in our lives need be fatal or final, although we certainly... Uh, suffer for our sins. God gave new beginnings to Abraham, Moses, David, Jonah, and Peter when they failed. And he can do the same thing for us today. One thing's required, repentance. So what did the uh, uh, enemy do in chapter 18? 
proud sinners do not enjoy hearing about God's sovereignty or the threat of impending judgment. They think by silencing the messenger, they will silence the message. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Second Psalms uh, verse 4. Their argument was to paraphrase, if we may. We have plenty of priests, prophets, and elders, so we can do without Jeremiah. This is not the first time Jeremiah faced a conspiracy that threatened his ministry or his life. And uh, you, you can find that in Jeremiah 11, chapter 12, chapter and 15th chapter. <clears throat> but it would not be the last time either. His enemies were not valiant for the truth and bent their tongues uh, for lies about him. You can see uh, chapter 9, verse 3 and, and verse 5. They attacked him with a tongue in verse 8 of chapter 18, you know, which means what they they were doing, they're lying about him. The pro plot probably included quotations from his messages that suggested that he was a traitor to the kingdom of Judah, as they viewed it. Like the men who plotted against Jesus, Jeremiah's enemies tried to prove that he was breaking the law and stirring up the people. And you can see this in Luke uh, 23rd chapter, uh, first part there. Now, no one enjoys opposition, but faithful servants of God expect it. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the, the world. John 16, verse 33. He also said, the world hates you. You know that it hated me before it hated you, John 15, verse 18. And Paul reminded Timothy and us, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 12. And we see the suffering of uh, um, Jeremiah in verses 19 through 23. Now, this is the fifth of Jeremiah's private, you can call them laments or prayers, uh, to the Lord concerning his situation and his ministry. Those who opposed him were opposing God. Therefore, Jeremiah asked God to deal with him. Now, we know that uh, God said, Vengeance is mine, repay no one with evil. That's found in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verse 35, and is repeated in Romans chapter 12. Like Elijah and all the other prophets, Jeremiah was a man subject to like passions as we are. James 5 17 in the King James, or with a like nature, uh, with a nature like ours in the New King James. And he felt a deep pain because uh, the leaders rejected the truth. Now, it's natural if you and I were to attack by hateful enemies who lied about us, set traps for us, and duck pits for us, that we would get upset. The proper response would be to ask God to deal with them. At least Jeremiah expressed himself honestly to God and then left the matter to him. He needed to remember God's promises when God first called him in the first part of the first chapter. And he needed to rest in the assurance that the Lord would see him through. There is a righteous anger against sin that is acceptable to God. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. And that's a quote from Psalms. And also, you who love the Lord hate evil. We are to hate evil. Psalms, 97th Psalm, verse 10. Jesus was angry at the hardening of the hearts of his critics, Mark 3, verse 5. And Paul was angry because of professed believers who were leading others astray. He said, we, Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 29. Unrighteous anger makes... Uh, takes matters into his own hands and seeks to destroy the offender while righteous anger turns the matter over to God and seek, uh, seeks to help the uh, offended person. Anguish is anger plus love. 
and it is not easy to maintain a proper balance, but we must. Jeremiah was angry at the evil perpetrated against him, but he turned it over to the Lord. Perhaps we are not angry enough uh, at the evil in this world, and we see it all around us. We're exposed to so much violence and sin in the media that we tend to accept it as a normal part of life and want nothing to do about it. Crusading has given way to compromising, and it is not politically correct to be dogmatic about righteousness or to be critical of ideas that are unbiblical. And we have to be careful uh, that we're, when we do oppose things that we're doing exactly that. So Jeremiah was the uh, uh, persecuted prophet in the first part of uh, 19th chapter of Jeremiah. There, now, we come to Pascur. Now, the theme of the potter continues uh, with another action uh, from our, our sermon from Jeremiah, a sermon that cost him a beating and a night in the stocks. In chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, at the command of the Lord, Jeremiah made a second trip to the potter's house, this time as a customer and not a spectator. So he, he bought a uh, pot, and he proceeded to the valley of the son of Hinnom by the entry of the pot church gate, and he took with him some of the uh, Jewish elders. It was there that Jeremiah proclaimed the words that God told him. It was a message of catastrophe. It was unlikely that the elders were sympathetic to this message, seeing that Pascual was informed by someone, if not the elders, Jeremiah even went into the court of the Lord's house and repeated the pronouncement of doom. His obedient faith was on display in that he was willing to walk with the elders and then declare in their very presence the disaster that was coming to the land because of their sins. Obviously, his lament, or prayer, if you will, to the Lord had brought him peace and courage. The east gate was the potsherd's gate, where the potters worked and the broken pottery was thrown out. It overlooked the valley of the son of Hinnom, the Jewish garbage dump, Gehenna. But Jeremiah turned the gate into a pulpit and declared impending disaster because of what the kings of Judah had done. That is, forsaken God, worshiped idols, desecrated the temple, murdered the innocent, and offered their children in altar fires dedicated to Baal and Moloch. This valley had been a center of idol worship, but Josiah had desecrated it by making it a garbage dump. Tophet, as it was called, is a, it's a now unknown location in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He was made infamous by the immolation uh, done in it of children to Moloch. It means, the word means a fire pit, a hearth, because the little children have been put through the fires there. After the Babylonian invasion, however, the new name would be the Valley of Slaughter. The siege would be so bad that the Jews would have to eat their own children to stay alive. So judgment is announced by uh, Jeremiah. It says in, in uh, verse 7 of chapter 19, I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. To demonstrate this, Jeremiah broke a clay jar and said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, even so, I will break this people in the city as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. The nation was beyond discipline. You can find that in Second chapter, verse 23. Uh, it was beyond prayer. Now... It was beyond repair. They had so hardened themselves against the Lord that all hope was lost. Now, it was a custom in the uh, day that kings and generals, uh, they, they often smashed clay jars and uh, 
some sort of special ceremony to, before they went out to battle that's indicate how they were going to smash the enemy. So this image is also used of the Messiah in Psalms 2 chapter verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. There, it was the enemy nations. But here, it was God smashing his own people. We can only imagine how angry the elders were who had accompanied Jeremiah to the partridge gate. After all, they and the priest, and you know, Jeremiah was a priest, had endorsed the peace messages of the false prophets as well as the political schemes of the civil leaders who had hoped to get help from Judah's ungodly allies. But what Jeremiah did next made them even, even angrier because he went to the temple and preached the sermon again. For a man who was broken before God, he certainly had courage before his enemies, but he was trusting God's promises of help, Jeremiah 1 verse 7, and of course in this uh, chapter, verses 17 through 19, it was the Lord that was sustaining him through, through these troubles. Well, a question that we should ask is, can nations and individuals sin so greatly that even God cannot restore them? That's a valid question, wouldn't you say? They can be restored if the clay is pliable in the hands of the potter. He can make it again if it, if it becomes marred. But when the clay becomes hardened, it is too late to remake it. In such a circumstance, judgment is the only response to willful apostasy. The northern kingdom of Israel refused to repent, and the Assyrians took it captive. And the southern kingdom now, that's Judah, was resisting God's truth, and Babylon would destroy the land and deport the people. The Jewish people rejected their king, when they asked Pilate to crucify Jesus 40 years, uh, I should say 40 years later, the Romans, after uh, Jesus was crucified, the Romans did the same thing to Jerusalem. They destroyed, just like the Babylonians had destroyed uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem so many years before. There is a sin unto death, 1 John 5, 16. That's the unrepented of kind. So in the 20th, 20th chapter, uh, Jeremiah is going through a bit of a rough spot here. What before had been threats now became reality. Pashkur, the son of Emir, a priest and chief governor of the house of the Lord, did not like what Jeremiah was saying. Therefore, he struck Jeremiah. Now, <clears throat> likely he had uh, Jeremiah beaten because, you know, he was the chief governor after all. He, he didn't have to do that sort of thing. But he had him put in the stocks until the next day. The stocks were located at a prominent place in the temple area and it was designed to add shame to the pain. Stocks were not intended to be comfortable. And when you had the pain of the beating, you can imagine how uh, Jeremiah felt. Being beaten and put in the stocks was the first of several acts of persecution the leaders inflicted on Jeremiah. They threatened to kill him, Jeremiah 26. They accused him falsely and imprisoned him, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 37. They put him into pit, Jeremiah 38. And he was an official prisoner until Nebuchadnezzar set him free, in chapter 39 of Jeremiah. God, however, met with Jeremiah that night and gave him a special message and a new name for Pashkur. And Pashkur is hard enough to pronounce, but his new name was Magor Misabib. Now, I want y'all, I'm going to give you that on a test now. Magor Misabib, which means uh, a fright from all around or fears on every side. Jeremiah had used this phrase before, which I'm not going to repeat, and he would use it again. 
he described what would happen to Jerusalem when the Babylon army finally moved in. For the first time, Jeremiah named the king of Babylon as the invader, chapter 20, verse 4. Previously, Jeremiah had announced an invasion from the north, and you can see that in the number of verses in, uh, preceding the, chapter 20, but he, he never named the invading nation. Now, the uh, tool of God's discipline was identified as Babylon, and Jeremiah would mention Babylon in one way or another about 200 times in this book. Pascua's treatment of uh, Jeremiah would receive just recompense for he and his family would be taken captive to Babylon and there they would die. For a Jew to be buried outside his own land was considered a, a judgment of, of sorts for the Gentile lands were considered unclean. For Pascua and his friends, however, really what difference would that make? They had been preaching lies in the name of God and the God of truth. They had been encouraging idolatry in the temple of the Holy God. So why not live in a land of lies and idols and eventually be buried there? They'd be just a riot at home. If the events described in the 18th through 20th chapter of Jeremiah took place during the reign of Jehoiakim, then it did not take long for Jeremiah's prophecy to be fulfilled. Jehoiakim ruled from 607 B.C. to 597 B.C. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar plundered the temple and took Jehoiakim and the nobles to Babylon. In 597, he carried off over 10,000 people, and 11 years later, he burned the temple, and he burned the city, and he left it in ruins. Five years later, he deported another group of exiles, so this certainly is probably a discouragement to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 20, chapter verse 7 through 18, and this is the last of Jeremiah's recorded laments or prayers, if you want to call them that. It is a human blending of grief and joy and prayer and despair, praise and perplexity. When one calls to mind the sensitive nature of this man and the tremendous trials he endured, it's no surprise that he is on the mountain top one minute and in the deepest valley the next. Jeremiah, however, lived above his moods, and he did not uh, he did the will of God regardless of how he felt. In this honest expression of his deepest emotions, the prophet dealt with three important concerns: God's call in verses seven through nine his daily peril in verses 10 through 13, and his inner despair in verses 14 through 18. So we might think of uh, his uh, call as he, he sort of, he would kind of consider it a deceptive call, and we, we'll explain that. So when the servants of God find themselves in trouble uh, because they have been faithful ministers, they are often tempted to question their call and can reconsider their vocation. Then what do they do? One of the first things they ought to do is to pray to the Lord about it and tell him the truth, how they feel. The word translated deceived in the King James Version is translated induced and persuaded in the New King James, and it carries with the idea of being enticed or seduced. Of course, God does not lie, Titus 1, verse 2, but Jeremiah felt that the Lord had induced him to under, uh, undertake a task for which he was unsuitable. Regardless of what Jeremiah thought, God prevailed and Jeremiah fulfilled all that, the, uh, that the, uh, God expected of him. As a man, he was inadequate to the task. But with God on his side, he accomplished exactly what the God uh, what God expected of him. In the first seven, chapter twenty, he says, "You induced me and prevailed." <clears throat> when you review the account of Jeremiah's call in in the first chapter, you find no evidence that God had seduced him with enlightened promises. The Lord had told him plainly that he would have a difficult time 
If he trusted the Lord, however, he would make him a fortified city and a, and a bronze wall before his enemies. God had warned his servant that the demands of his of, uh, ministry would increase and that he would have to grow in order to keep going. Verses uh, chapter 12, verse 5. What Jeremiah's ministry was doing for the nation was important, but even more important was what Jeremiah's ministry was doing for Jeremiah. As we serve the Lord, our capacity for uh, serving should increase and enable us to do much more than we ever thought we could do. After you have uh, uploaded, unloaded your burdens on God, what do you do next? Jeremiah resolved to quit being a prophet. He decided to keep his mouth shut and not even mention the Lord to anybody. To anybody. <clears throat> but that didn't work because the message of God was like a burning in his heart and a fire in his bones. <clears throat> Jeremiah did not preach because he had to say something, but because he had something to say. And yeah, not saying it would have destroyed him. Paul had the same attitude for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. Well, what about uh, Jeremiah's daily peril? He talked about that. So having settled the matter of his call in the first part of chapter 20, Jeremiah then looked away from himself to the enemies around him. Faith does not ignore problems. It faces them honestly and seeks God's help in solving them. No matter how much he was constrained to preach God's word, Jeremiah had to deal with the fact that many people wanted to keep uh, him to keep quiet, and they would take the necessary steps to silence him. Barring the new name God gave Pascuiter, a name I am not going to mention, it is possible that Jeremiah's enemies used terror on every side, which is what it meant as a nickname for the prophet. It was another way to ridicule his prophecies before the people. They watched him and took note of what uh, he did and said so they could find something criminal in their view to report to the authorities. David had a similar experience, Psalm 31, verse 13. And this is the way the enemies of Jesus treated him, Matthew 22, chapter, verse 15 and following. Jeremiah, Jeremiah's mood swings from expressing courage to seeking, to seeking revenge and then to rejoicing, rejoicing in worship. That a part of the uh, 20th chapter. Remembering the promises God gave him at his call, Jeremiah was confident that the Lord was with him and would deal effectively with, with his enemies. Instead of dishonoring him, his enemies would themselves be dishonored. Since his words in verse 12, that is, let me see your vengeance on them, are almost identical to the prayer in chapter 11, verse 20, uh, perhaps it is one that uh, Jeremiah prayed often. He was in deep despair, uh, verses 14 through 18. So after he had uh, committed his cause to the Lord, he had every reason to rejoice. For now the Lord would have to bear his burdens and help fight his battles. In Psalm 60, 62nd Psalm, verse 8, we read, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Jeremiah's euphoria did not last long, however, because in the next breath he was cursing his birth, as he did in Jeremiah the 15th chapter, verse 10, and might also look at Job, how Job handled that. Jewish parents would uh, rejoice at the birth uh, of a son in particular, who would wear the family name and be able to sustain uh, his parents in old age. A priestly family like Jeremiah's would be especially grateful for a son who would carry on the ministry to the Lord. 
But Jeremiah's ideas were different. The messenger who announced that a son had been born would bring joy to the family and expect a reward for bringing such good news. But Jeremiah asked that the man who brought news of his birth to his father be cursed like Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted that man to awaken to a weeping in the morning and to hear the shouting of battle cries every noon. Why did not my mother's womb become a grave, asked the prophet. My life is nothing but labor and sorrow and shame, better that I had never lived. Why did I come forth from the womb, Jeremiah asked. Because God had a special purpose for his life and designed his life that he should fulfill it. God makes no mistakes when he calls his servants, and we should take care not to question his wisdom. All of us have had times of discouragement when we have felt like quitting, but that is when we must look beyond our feelings and circumstances and see the greatness and wisdom of God. As discouraging as time, time may seem, it is too early to quit. Again, that is a review of the, uh, those three chapters of Jeremiah. I hope it's been profitable for you. Again, I'd like to have the opportunity for any who would like to render obedience to the gospel, who have come to a belief that Jesus is the Son of God, repented of their, repent their sins, and would like to make the good confession and be baptized into Christ. If, if that is the case for anyone or you need to repent of sins, we want to allow that opportunity as we now stand and sing.